I, I would go into meetings with customers and they go, and you can guarantee me that I'll have this same coffee all year round. And they go, no, I won't do that. I, I, don't, I don't want to do that. It's an agricultural product that changes every season. But you either go for it and you say, I'm going to blend these coffees to get the same taste. Or you do exactly the opposite and you go, I'm going to blend these coffees to get the best taste and I don't care if it changes and I don't care if it's different from three months ago. And that's what we do. We embrace the difference. Alchemy Coffee is a coffee roaster first and foremost. We are an importer of coffee, so we go directly out to Origin and we liaise with our coffee partners and we buy green coffee. We then export that green coffee, ship it over to the UK where we roast it and we generally wholesale it to coffee customers who are, for the most part, quality focused, independently owned coffee shops, restaurants, hotels. At the moment, about 70% of the coffee that we roast is what we would call direct trade, where we go out to the country that the coffee is grown in, we visit the producer, the farm, we spend time going around the farm talking, asking questions of the producer, looking at what they're doing. We generally taste the coffee when we're out there, but we don't immediately buy it. We look at all the processes and practices that they're doing we discuss the price with the farmer directly um, and then we come back here taste the coffee in our own environment there's a couple of reasons for doing that one anybody who's brought back a bottle of lemon chilio from holiday knows that it doesn't taste the same when you get it back to your flat same with coffee when you're at origin and it's all exciting the coffee tastes different but also coffee grows on mountains so it, quite often we're at elevations of 1,600 meters. Your palate behaves differently. The water there is different. The food that you've been eating is different. Everything is different. So the image you get of the coffee could be considerably different from what it will taste like when you get it back to your own home country. My roastery is 16 meters above sea level, not 1,600 meters. Also, when you're at Origin, the coffee is very, very fresh. It's been picked off the trees and processed very recently, and it hasn't really had time to settle down. So there are a lot of developments and flavors that, that take place in the two to three months after the coffee's been picked, and you want to give that time to rest. You want to explore what happens to that coffee after it's settled before you make your final decision. When we buy coffee, we tend to go anywhere from a quarter of a container to a full container of coffee. So a full container of coffee is 18 tonnes, it's about 300 sacks of coffee. We taste the coffee with the farmer and we agree that we're going to buy it and he sends us what's called an offer sample. It's a hand-sorted sample that somebody sits at a table and grades and sorts and makes sure it's okay. They send it to us, we roast it, taste it and agree we're going to buy it. The farmer then has to process the whole bulk of the coffee and that's done with agricultural machinery, not with somebody sitting there doing it by hand. So once they've done that, they send us what's called a pre-shipment sample and that compares against the offer sample. It's the same coffee, but one's been sorted by hand and one's been sorted by machine. We taste that and again, we agree, yeah, I'm happy this is the same coffee, please ship. I book the container from the UK side. I pay for the container. I'm in charge of all the shipping. I pay the shipping company and I give them the details of who is going to be exporting it. We've been working with farmers who are exporters themselves. They have a license to export so that we're not introducing a middleman who's gonna take a cut. They will process all of the coffee and they will get it ready for shipping. They will contact the shipping company and the shipping company will arrange a date, send the container out, and they will fill the container with coffee. At this point, most of the coffee we buy, we buy FOB, free on board, and that's a designation for the risk. So at this point, the coffee risk is still with the farmer. So if something goes wrong in the processing and a 
drum of diesel spills all over the coffee, his risk, his loss. Once it goes back onto the truck and gets to the boat, my risk. So it's now that OB section of FOB, it's on board, it's been given to the ship, it is my coffee. So if the ship sinks, my coffee. If the container falls overboard and gets contaminated with salt water, my coffee. And I have to pay the farmer for it, whether the ship sinks or not. We have to take insurances for that kind of thing. We have to, I had to learn quite a bit about antiquated 200 year old shipping law because everything to do with shipping is from the 17, 1800s. And there's a lot of language that we had to learn and a lot of processes that we're still learning. But the, the ship will then probably take from Central America four weeks to sail over to the UK. And then we have to have an importing agent. And this is something that we can't do because we don't have an importing license. But the importer purely deals with customs and clears the container and puts it on a truck that comes to me. Now, Customs can do what they like with my container when it arrives. They can wave it past, they can agree to do a seal check where they check all the documents against the seal on the door of the container. They can x-ray the container or they can open the container, cut the seal with some bolt cutters, pull every bag of coffee out onto the wharf, inspect the entire container and then put it all back in again. So last year our container got delayed while customs inspected it and we got a 300 pound bill for the time that it sat on the wharf. We have no control of what customs decides to do. They are the referee. You don't argue with the referee. You just have to accept that that's part of the risk. Within that process, the documents have arrived. So these are the documents that the farmer had to produce in order to export the coffee. These are certificate of origin, phytosanitary certificate, which is like a biological safety certificate, and a bill of lading, which is a commercial document that lists everything that's in the container. He can't send me those documents until the ship has sailed. I can't import the container until I have the documents. So you have that window while the container is on the ocean that I'm constantly going, have you, have you sent the documents yet? Because when the container arrives, I will be billed mm -hmm. for every day it sits there mm -hmm. until I present the documents. Mm -hmm. And it's not unusual for us to have to wait for the documents to arrive. And you learn to play the game. So I have to get three originals of every document because when I post the first one, it might get lost in the post. And then I post the second one. And if that gets lost in the post, then I've only got one left. And I get in my car and I drive that to the port. And I hand it over because you can't import with copies. We then get the container put on a truck. It costs nearly 40% as much for the container to come from East London to Southwest London as it costs it to come from Guatemala to London. It comes here and we have two hours to unload it. Everybody gets to do their gym work that day as we start putting 69 kilo coffee bags on our shoulders and moving them around. So lots of logistics, logistically heavy, quite a difficult thing for small companies to do. Lots of them will um, do what's called consolidating, which is you buy 40 or 50 bags and you get it put into somebody else's container. I won't do that. Everything that goes into that container needs a certificate. So if you have 10 farmers putting coffee, then you need 10 certificates and they all need to be gathered at the same time and given to customs at the same time. And we've had containers delayed three, four months because we've been waiting for people. And your coffee is aging in that container while you're waiting. It's still your coffee. You still got to pay for it. But if it arrives and it's no good because you waited too long, that's your risk. So we won't do that. So this is our lab. It's a QAQC, Quality Assurance Quality Control Lab for buying green coffee. And it's also a lab for looking at the quality of our roasted coffee. So we do production testing and we do buying testing in here. It's also where we would use the espresso machine and the grinders to develop blends of coffee, to monitor blends of coffee through their lifespan to see how they're aging, if they're still tasting the way we want them to taste. So what most people have seen would be this, which is roasted coffee. And that's the final product. That's, that's the absolute end product that goes to you. What comes to us is that, which is a green raw product. 
and it can be produced in a number of ways. The easiest one to understand and the first one that I think we should look at is this is what's called the natural process. So this is where they take the entire coffee cherry. It's got the skin and it's got the flesh and it's got the two seeds inside and they dry it. Take it out either onto a, a concrete patio or onto a wooden and mesh table called a raised bed. Let the air get under it, let it get nice and uniformly dry. And they would dry that for anywhere up to 28 days, dry all the moisture out of it, and then they take it to a machine and split it open. And you can see the skin comes off and inside you've got the two seeds. And there's one of them there that's inside there. And they would mechanically husk that off and that would be called naturally processed or dry processed coffee. Happens in places where they don't have a lot of water or well, now it's starting to happen driven by the buyers because our customers are after interesting and exciting coffees and you get a lot of that here. You get a lot of boozy, alcohol-like flavors. Not nasty, but more like your sort of bourbons and sherries. You get a lot of fruit flavors. You'll get a lot of sweetness and you'll get a lot of interesting, dominant, powerful flavors. But they might be a bit muddled because it's the whole process of drying this and the, uh, the flavors sort of osmosing into the bean as it dries over that period. Quite wild flavors sometimes. The opposite of that is this, which is called washed coffee. What they've done here is they've pulped off the skin and most of the fruit of the cherry and then they've washed it through water and scrubbing machines to scrub all of that flesh off to get all the way down to the parchment, which you can see is very, very clean. And that's then dried, the parchment's taken off, and we get our green coffee. But these are very, very precise flavors. And then you have in the middle, you have these sorts of coffees, which are called honey processed or pulp natural. And this is where it's a mixture of the two processes. So like the washed coffee, they pulp off the skin, but this time they do leave some of the flesh like you have in the dry process. And you'll find when you taste it that the flavor will be between the washed and the natural. So you'll get sweeter, fruitier, but not as extreme. And those coffees are proving really, really popular, particularly in espresso blends. In terms of the labbing type stuff we do, we look at tests like moisture content because that tends to indicate how the coffee will age and how long it will stay fresh. We would look at things like density, we would look at things like um, the size of the beans. So if you took a full joint of pork and a sausage and you put them in the same oven for the same time at the same temperature, by the time the roast is done, the sausage is cremated, it's gone. So you want to have them roughly the same size so they behave the same way and they take on the same characteristics. So we specify when we're purchasing a range of sizes that we're willing to accept and labbing all this stuff when it comes back in, reporting back to the farmer whether or not he's hit the criteria that we've specified. When those green coffee containers arrive, we would take a sample of the coffee and we would compare it to the pre-shipment sample to make sure it's the same coffee. So we would get a sample sort of like these. These are samples of green coffee that would be sent over before the container sales. We would roast them and we would do what's called cupping. Cupping is a regimented procedure for tasting and evaluating coffee. You use the same amount of coffee, you use the same amount of water, the same temperature of water, you expose the coffee to the water for the same amount of time, and then you taste it. We actually slurp the, um, the coffee off the spoon. We want to aerate it, we want to get it onto our palates. We're trying to evaluate acidity, sweetness, mouthfeel, balance, 
there's a, a list of particular items that we go through for every coffee. And we always cup coffees blind, and that way there's no bias. Whenever somebody's drunk a glass of wine, and someone says, oh, what wine is that? If you don't know, you've got to stop and think about it and go, okay, well, it tastes like a Chardonnay or it tastes like this. But if you've seen the label of the wine, you already have a preconception of what that tastes like. And suddenly it tastes like that thing because you know it should. Coffee's the same. We don't want any preconceptions. We want to go in and evaluate. We taste the coffees and we compare them and we go, yes, this is the same coffee. Yes, the quality is acceptable. And we approve that coffee. All of the coffees are very, very different. Like things like wine, there are different varieties, there are different um, processes, and there are different flavors and properties of different coffees. So a Bourbon coffee grown in Rwanda doesn't taste the same as a Bourbon coffee grown in El Salvador or a Bourbon coffee grown, for example, in Brazil. What we have to do is firstly consider flavor. What flavor does this coffee bring? That's usually easily broken down to three things. All coffee tastes like coffee. All coffee tastes like chocolate. Then there's everything else it tastes like. Because there's 10 different sugar flavors that you can get through. Is it sweet like honey? Or is it sweet like fruit juice? Or is it sweet like molasses? Or is it sweet like maple syrup? or toffee? Does it have any fruit flavours? And if it has fruit, what kind of fruit? Does it have flavours like apple or is it more tropical fruit? And if it's tropical fruit, is it um, pineapple or is it papaya? Or does it taste like berries in fact? These are all nuances and subtleties. Generally they're not blow the back of your head out. But in some there are. In some Kenyan coffees you'll get such an amazing smell of and flavour of blueberries. But we have to work out, do we need that or do we want that? Because if 90% of the public want something else, then we should accommodate that. So it might be that an amazing apricot-flavoured African coffee, I can only buy three or four bags of it because there isn't that much demand for it. Or it could be that if it's a particularly chocolatey coffee from Brazil, I might buy 150 bags of that because that's going to be our number one espresso blend for the whole year going forward. So once we've established what flavours are in the coffees, we've got to work out how are we going to use them. So it might be that one coffee is so good that it stands on its own and we might release that as a single origin coffee. This is an exploration of this farm to taste this thing, its amazing apricot flavour. It might be that we're trying to find a balanced blend to be a house coffee for a coffee shop and they want to have something that has a broad appeal to people. It's got to be a high quality coffee but it's got to work well in milk and they need a predominantly chocolate flavour note. So there might not be a single coffee that hits all of those parameters for them. So what we have to do is we have to build, we have to construct a blend. If we think that this coffee is going to take three components, almost like if you think musically, one's going to provide the bass note, it's going to be body and it's going to be chocolate. Does it do that? The next one we're thinking mid notes, so that might provide the sweetness or it might provide an acidity that adds to the bass notes to make it a bit more vibrant. And then the next one might be the top notes. I don't want it to just taste of chocolate, I want to have a little bit of blueberry or a little bit of apricot or something coming through just to give it some interest. And that's where you combine the different coffees and you have to know what they each bring separately so that you can know what they might bring to the party. And then you've got to remember that they don't always play nice with the other children. So you, you, on paper you've got these two coffees and you put them together and they're going to taste amazing. Except when you put them together they react with each other and they taste terrible and then you've got to pull it apart and start again. This is our G-Series 30 kilo roaster. Her name is Hilda, which is short for Brunhilde. Uh, Brunhilde is the lady who sings at the end of Wagner's long five-hour epic. So we've had our own long German epic trying to get this roaster, and we would appreciate it very much if she would sing now for us. It's been a long time waiting. We wanted to buy a pre-1959 German roaster. Probat, Bath, 
Got Hot, one of the classic German coffee roaster manufacturers. People ask us a, a lot, why would you go down this path of pain to get an old roaster and restore it when you can just buy one from the factory? Like you'll hear from your dad, they don't make them like this anymore. So the front plate on this roaster is nearly an inch thick. It's just solid, high quality cast iron. It also has a plate on the back around the other side behind the drum. So the drum is sandwiched between these two heat sources. Underneath are the burners. They heat the drum, they heat the air that is drawn over the burners and brought into the drum. This roaster is a double walled roaster. So it has two drums separated by air so that the coffee is on the inside drum, the flame is on the outside drum. There are no hot spots. There are no issues of scorching the beans as they touch a drum that's too hot. A lot of modern roasters, for cheapness, have gone to a single wall drum. The two front and back plates concentrate the heat. These sort of parts here are really, really heavy cast iron. When that part heats up, it stays hot. So there's just that, that consistency was what we were looking for and that build quality. We know it was made between 1920 and 1940. That's when the model started, and that's when, due to an international dispute that was going on at the time, we bombed the factory that it was made in. We think from another roaster that we've seen that we can date this somewhere around late 1920s, early 1930s. People who worked in those times had a job for life. They were expected to learn a craft. They were expected to learn from other employees, older employees who'd worked there, and they would develop skills and they would carry those skills their entire life. That kind of employment is gone to a large extent now. We want to bring back the skill of doing something. So I love the fact that this requires constant maintenance. It requires constant attention to detail and it requires a skilled operator, not an iPhone, an operator, a human to roast on it. And what it gives you back in return is it gives you a lot of control because you're expected to know what you're doing and the tools to do that and explore that are there. But we've modified some of them so when this first came it had one electric motor and that powered everything through a series of big exposed belts. Now the problem with those in a modern environment is they all pick one of your employees up and throw them across the warehouse which we <laughs> We can't, have, we can't have that anymore. So what we've done is we've changed them all. Everywhere there was a belt, there is now a motor controlled by an inverter drive that allows us to change the speed of that motor. So I can control anything I want to control to get the quality of coffee I want to get. When the roaster came from the factory, there were no temperature probes. There was just one single dial, which is on the other side of this neck, which just tells you roughly how hot the air is. And that was it. Uh, what you were expected to do was to stick a trier into here. That's the trier there. So it's a long tube with a receiver on the end of it. That goes into the front of the roaster, spins around. You pull it out. You'd have the coffee in there. And you would smell it and look at it and pop it back in there. I need to know exactly what's going on in this roaster. I need to know what's going on with the beans and I need to know what's going on with the air and not just what is the temperature but how quickly is it changing. And so we've added these temperature probes in order to get the feedback loop that we need. What we've tried to do is to combine the architecture and the structure of a 1920s roaster with the control and reporting systems of a 21st century roaster. So the process that we go through when we're roasting coffee here is we have a, a pneumatic feeder. You load the coffee into the cone, turn on the pump, open the lever, and the pump blows the coffee up into the hopper. When you've got it at the temperature that's stable, that you're happy that you want to drop the coffee in it, we drop the coffee, it falls down through the neck into the drum, where it's turning around constantly and there are paddles inside the drum that throw the coffee into the airstream and back down again. 
So it's mixed up very, very uniformly through the, the hot air stream. We go through a process that takes about 12 to 13 minutes. All of that process is tracked, all of that process is graphed and monitored by the human roaster rather than the machine. And that person makes all the adjustments to the gas that are needed to hit the curve that he's looking for. It's not just an end temperature, but it's a how we got there. And it's very, very important to the flavor of the coffee that comes out, the journey that it goes through. Once we've got to where we want to be, we want to take the coffee out. There's a lever on the other side that acts this counterweight, opens the door, and the coffee paddles push the coffee out into the cooling tray. The cooling tray here, you can see, is a massive big tray. The whole point of that is to get the coffee back to room temperature as quickly as possible. I've had it where some of it came out and it got stuck in the, the cuff of my shirt and it burnt through my cotton shirt and stuck to my skin. So this is, this is 200 degree coffee and within four minutes I can pick it up and smell it and break it and eat it. The next stage is to get it out of the cooling tray. We have a drawer at the front that we can open up and the paddles will sweep the coffee out. But coffee is an agricultural product. There may be a stone or a small piece of metal that came from one of the pieces of equipment during the process. I can't have one of my customers find that in their grinder. So we have an item over here called the destoner. The coffee falls into the bottom of the destoner. It's sucked up through a fan that creates a vacuum. You balance the speed of the fan against the density of the coffee. Heavier objects like stones, bits of metal, can't float up. They're trapped in the mesh at the bottom, which can be collected and removed. We then have the coffee safely inside the destoner, and we can load it into buckets for transport over to the packing station, where we can weigh the coffee out and pack it up or grind it if necessary for our customers. There's a lot of bad coffee out there. There's a lot of coffee that tastes like an ashtray. There's a lot of coffee that you have to put two sugars in and pinch your nose to get down. But there's a dramatic increase in people who don't drink that anymore. That they are well-traveled, they are experienced with different cuisines from around the world, and they're not going to accept that kind of coffee. They want something that's been well thought out that's been executed well, it's been grown well, it's been roasted well, and it's been made well in the cafe. Our own cafe in Blackfriars, we've seen this amazingly. The, the number of people who really, really interact with our staff and they want to know as much about the coffee as they can and we need to work with them to give them that. We also have to realise that when you come in at seven o'clock in the morning and you look slightly hungover, Maybe now's not the time to interact with you. Maybe the time to just give you a cup of coffee and step back. Mm -hmm.